The past is where you learn the lesson, but the future is where you apply it. It's time to mock draft as we ramp up for redraft. Welcome again, one and all, back to JWB Fantasy Football, your friendliest fantasy football faces on the internet. I am your solo host today. I am Justin, Will underscore FF. Very happy to be here with you. We wanted to take some time after finishing up our position by position breakdown through the Ramp Up to Redraft series to try and put all of that together into one cohesive team and see what we get. So today we're going to be using Sleeper, as you can see on the screen if you're watching us there on YouTube, to execute a pretty standard mock draft. First, let's talk about the scoring. We're going to treat this as just your regular home league, office league, ESPN, for example. 15 rounds, one quarterback, four point for passing touchdown, half PPR. Two running backs, two wide receivers, tight end and flex, kicker and defense, nothing crazy. We're even going to treat this like you may find on ESPN, where even though we advise you to avoid drafting a kicker and defense and instead load up on handcuffs like you heard from Jake and Tyler just a few days ago, you're forced to draft a kicker and defense on those platforms. So we're going to play this right down the middle and see what we get. I've assigned myself to the number six spot because I think it is one of the more difficult places to draft. It also seems to be the place that I find the most trepidation. Love drafting at the beginning, love drafting late on the turn, but something about being in the middle is a little scarier. So we're going to execute this mock draft out of the six hole and see what we get. Before we start the draft, let's go through and outline some of the principles that we learned during this series. First is quarterbacks. That taught us that quarterbacks drafted about 8 through 12 off the board were the highest return on investment. They have a very good chance of finishing at their ADP or higher, and we're not risking a fourth, fifth, sixth round pick on one of the higher taken quarterbacks. That's going to hurt us a lot if they get injured. Now, there are some exceptions to that. If we find ourselves with Stephon Diggs, if we find ourselves with Travis Kelsey, if we find ourselves with A.J. Brown or Mark Andrews, for example. Those rushing quarterbacks that have good upside are going to be much more in play for us if we're assembling a stack. And if we happen to go through this draft and find that we've taken Hollywood Brown at value and DeAndre Hopkins is on the board later behind us, we're going to maybe bump Kyler Murray a little bit higher than we normally would. But our plan, which we always want to go into a draft with a plan, is to get quarterback very, very late in this one quarterback league. Two is running backs. The biggest takeaway from the running backs episode, at least for me, is that the reason why we're drafting running backs at the top of the draft is because the hit rate on those guys taken in rounds one and round two from a point per game perspective is very justified. You got a better chance of finding guys who are going to deliver in that area if you take them in round one or round two. So picking sixth, we're looking at Christian McCaffrey, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, Dalvin Cook. Those are the four guys that we're trying to see fall to us at six. If it doesn't happen, that means we're taking either Justin Jefferson or Cooper Cup, and we're going to have to pivot. But if you find yourself with one of those wide receivers in round one or Travis Kelsey, for example, you have to go into that knowing you're going to have to hit running back a little bit harder than you might have otherwise, because you need to proliferate some more guys to give yourself a better chance of hitting since you're not using those top picks. Three is wide receivers. Here, what we learned is that it's the middle rounds when we're avoiding the running back dead zone in three, four, five, six, that we want to accumulate as many wide receivers as we can. That's where we saw guys like Cooper Cup and Jamar Chase go last year. This year, we're turning our attention towards the Darnell Mooney, Rashad Bateman, Hollywood Browns of the world. If Michael Pittman falls to us at good value, right? We're trying to get those guys in the middle of those rounds to create a really good wide receiving core that gives us stability, but has a ton of upside. Once we get to double digit rounds, sure. Now we're looking for first and second year players with really high ceilings, especially at the running back and wide receiver position that we can add to our team in hopes that they become substantially better in the first couple weeks on some of the options that we have already taken. Fourth is tight end. We kind of know what we want to do, right? If we're at the end of the first round, we have our eyes on Travis Kelsey, either in round one or round two. If we're at the beginning of the first round, we have our eyes on Mark Andrews falling late into the second or going early third, depending on the quality of your home league. We'd love to get either of those guys there. After that, at least for me, we're looking at Kyle Pitts in round three. When we get to our 306 pick and we've got what will hopefully be two very good running backs or a running back and receiver already in place, 
We'll have to look and see if Pitts is available and if his potential outweighs what should be very good wide receivers that are in that area. If the answer to that is no, and we leave the first three rounds without Kelsey, Andrews, or Pitts, we're simply waiting to the very end of the draft to take one of the last tight ends off the board, no matter who that might be. Then we're going to plug and play and stream throughout the year as necessary. And then finally, kicker and defense. In this league, we're going to assume that we are obligated to use a draft pick on kicker and defense. We're not going to get cute. We're going to take defense in round 14, kicker in round 15, and that's just the way we're going to break it down. So let's try and put all this together and see what sort of team we can come up with. Go ahead and get our mock draft started and see how everything goes. As you can see on the board in front of you, and let's articulate this just in case not, not everyone can. Austin Eckler, a surprise 101, followed by Jonathan Taylor, Christian McCaffrey, Jamar Chase at 1-4, and then Najee Harris at 1-5. So we're already seeing some wild results that you wouldn't normally anticipate in a draft, which is why it's good to practice like this. Our plan coming into this was to go ahead and take Dalvin Cook at 6, assuming that Cooper Cup and Justin Jefferson are off the board. But here we are now looking at a half PPR draft where we have the ability to get Justin Jefferson, our number three overall player who we do have ahead of Dalvin Cook in this particular position. We want to get the running backs, but we can't pass up a guy like Justin Jefferson, especially if we can get him later in a draft. He's a person we're consistently see going in picks three or four in most drafts. If you find in your home league, you're at six, seven, eight, nine, and he has slid there because guys like Najee Harris and Guys like Najee Harris and Derrick Henry, for example, have moved up in the draft. Do not be afraid to go and take him. So we're going to lock in Justin Jefferson as our first player, knowing that this means we're going to have to be extra careful with how we execute our running back picks along the way. After us goes Cooper Cup, a whole bunch of players. Travis Kelsey's off the board, so we're not going to see Travis Kelsey falling to us in the middle of the second, which is totally to be expected. Our goal here now is to look specifically at what running backs we have available available to us that can cause the biggest wave, give us the best chance of hitting an RB1 that's going to sustain taking Justin Jefferson in the first round. Here's some guys that are already gone. Derrick Henry, Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, and then in the second round, DeAndre Swift, Saquon Barkley, Nick Chubb, and Aaron Jones. Good receivers are still available, but we've lost Cooper Cup after taking Justin Jefferson. We've lost Stephon Diggs. Those are the guys we'd really, really want to get after if we were able to do so. So here in this position, if you look at available running backs to you, you're going to see names like Alvin Kamara, Javante Williams, Leonard Fournette, Zeke Elliott, James Conner. Those are the guys we're most concerned with. Where we're at in the season, simply about two weeks away from the beginning of the NFL here now, we're really starting to buy into the idea that Alvin Kamara is going to have a regular full season schedule. The suspension looks more and more like if it's coming, it's coming next year, not this year. For us to use a middle of the second round pick on potential like Alvin Kamara is well worth it because on his day from a points per game perspective, he's going to provide us what we need to have those high end RB1 numbers. Would love if you and your home league get to this pick here in the middle of the second round and see that no one has taken Saquon that you jump on him. That might be my number one strategy for redraft leagues that I'm in this year that do not involve your sharper players, let's say, people who are a lot more casual. If I can find a falling Saquon, that's always where I want to go, but we're not seeing that in this draft and you got to play it as it lies. So we're going to plug in Alvin Kamara and give ourselves the first running back that we can during, during our draft. It's going to snake back around to us at 306, but while we're doing that and we're waiting for these picks to come in, which would be obviously a whole lot slower than what we're seeing now, we're thinking to ourselves, we're right down the middle. We're a balanced team. We've got Kamara. We've got Jefferson. There are some running backs that we would still love to have before we hit the dead zone. But what we don't want to do is bump up a running back who would normally be in the dead zone and take them here at 3-6 because we're worried about what will fall to us. And luckily for me, as I'm explaining this, it looks like this is exactly what has happened to us here. After our pick of Alvin Kamara, running backs that go leading up to 3-6 are Leonard Fournette, Zeke Elliott, Javante Williams, and James Conner, or the only running backs I'm interested in. As I now look at the running back landscape, I see Cam Akers, David Montgomery, Brees Hall, Travis Etienne, Antonio Gibson, Josh Jacobs. We're out on these guys. This is not a situation where we want to take one of them at round three. If Brees Hall or Travis Etienne continue to fall, they're a wonderful running back too. But if we're taking those guys, we really truly want to catch them at the best possible value. 
We're going to do a quick look at tight end because I do know that Kelsey and Mark Andrews have been taken, but Kyle Pitts is still available. So here we have to kind of weigh the cost benefit analysis of whether we want to take Kyle Pitts in the middle of the round, knowing that that means we get to put tight end to bed. I'm less apt to do this in a situation like this one where we know we're going to have to devote more important picks to running back because we need some extra coverage in that particular position. But if we look at wide receiver, and I'll even pop this out for anybody who's seeing things here on YouTube. We see a ton of guys who are great value that probably should have already gone a little bit sooner than they've went. Keenan Allen, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman, Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, DJ Moore are just a few of the wide receivers that are still available to us here. Now, according to both my rankings and I believe the JWB consensus rankings, T. Higgins is the highest rated of all of these players. So we're going to we're going to take him here and hope to continue to see some more value going forward. But that's going to give us Alvin Kamara, Justin Jefferson, and T. Higgins as we continue to do the draft. Quick look at quarterbacks, right? We always know we want to wait. We want to take him as late as possible. But now we're up to pick 407, and we can already see that some of the quarterbacks have started to come off the board, which many of you are going to see when you're involved in a home league, in a work draft, something of that nature. Josh Allen came off the board at 2-9 after we took Alvin Kamara. Patrick Mahomes and Justin Herbert have went in the set leading up to our fourth round pick now. Would have loved to have seen some good value on quarterback, but it doesn't seem like that's how it's going to go in this particular draft. This is where we want to look at our wide receiver core. We're already sitting on Justin Jefferson and T. Higgins, which means we're a little bit more curious about Kirk Cousins and definitely Joe Burrow than we would have been previously. But as far as reaching to take, let's say, Lamar Jackson now in round four, that's out of the question for us because we don't have Mark Andrews and we don't want to destroy any superiority we've created at the wide receiver position by reaching for something like quarterback too early. Kyle Pitts gone at 310. That means we're officially putting tight end to sleep until the end of the draft. So now we want to take a look at wide receivers that are still available. Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, Jalen Waddell, DK Metcalf, all still on the board. All great picks that you could be making at this point of the draft. Running backs, we have lost Brees Hall and Travis Etienne. That means two of the guys that we actually look at in the dead zone aren't there and aren't available for us. When we're picking from the running back dead zone, we want very high ceilings or simply maybe a better way to put this in the case of someone like Brees Hall. We want a guy who we know has the potential to be a first or second round return, but hasn't done it yet. And that's why he falls in the dead zone. Brees Hall and Travis Etienne are perfect examples of that. If we take them in rounds four or five, we're getting great value on someone who could finish in round one or round two. But because we haven't seen it, Brees Hall's a rookie. He just happens to fall a little bit farther down the board. We're not in that position here. So for us to reach and take Josh Jacobs or someone of that ilk, Antonio Gibson's off the board, but you may see that he's available in the middle of the fourth round in many a draft. For us to reach and take a player like this just because we only have Alvin Kamara destroys a lot of the goodwill we've created for ourselves by taking Justin Jefferson and T. Higgins already. So what we're going to do is take my highest wide receiver left available, which is not Terry McLaurin, Deontay Johnson, Jalen Waddell, or DK Metcalf. Here, it's Mike Williams. Absolutely love Mike Williams as a person who will give you huge spike weeks this year, which is something that we're always chasing at the wide receiver position. The data does suggest that we would rather take a boom or bust guy because the weeks that he booms, we're giving ourselves a good, dependable, easy win. And that we'd rather take a shot at that than taking someone who has a lower ceiling and higher floor that tends to always hit in the same area. That's going to take us up to the middle of round five. Justin Jefferson, T. Higgins, Mike Williams, and Tapped. Now, remember, this league does not have a third wide receiver. So we've effectively already filled our flex position at this point in the draft as well. After we take Mike Williams, a run on receivers helps us out a little bit. Deontay Johnson, Terry McLaurin, DK Metcalf, Jalen Waddle, Cortland Sutton, and Jerry Judy all go off the board. Kyler Murray is off the board. We're not really looking at quarterback. We're not really looking at tight end, especially with Kittle and Waller going around the fourth, which is where they go in this particular mock draft. So now we're wondering at home, do we take the second running back just to have one? If we take a fourth receiver here, it's someone that goes directly onto our bench. What's the value in taking a bench player before we fill a position like second running back or quarterback or tight end? This is an instance where we want to avoid that particular mentality. 
There are some good running backs that are available here in the fifth round, such as Elijah Mitchell and A.J. Dillon, who are perfectly fine to pick in this range if you're not comfortable waiting. But what we've learned and part of the reason that we've taken the time to look back at previous year's finishes and to look at that data is because it tells us that jumping to take that running back now does not necessarily mean that we will hit on that running back. Our chances of waiting and taking someone different a few rounds later may be just as good as if we jump to take the running back now. From a wide receiver perspective, we have a ton of players here who are still really, really good and really, really dependable. Allen Robinson, Marquise Brown, Chris Godwin, Brandon Cooks, Amon Ross St. Brown, Michael Thomas, Darnell Mooney are all guys who we expect to have great seasons. Almost all of them are massive breakout candidates. In a world where Allen Robinson becomes the number two with the Rams that we all hope he does. In a world where Hollywood Brown benefits from six weeks of being hyper-targeted by Kyler Murray while DeAndre Hopkins is sitting on the shelf. In a world where Amon Ross St. Brown turns into the breakout player many of us would like to see him become, and in a world where Michael Thomas returns to being Michael Thomas, passing up any of those wide receivers just because we feel the need to plug Elijah Mitchell into this lineup because he'll be a starter for us is not the right decision. So here we're going to go ahead and take Allen Robinson just because he's kind of a guy that we've been getting into a little bit more lately, loved by the community. We want to see what this draft looks like with him. This now gives us a ton of options at wide receiver. We've been able to assemble in five rounds a receiving core of Justin Jefferson, T. Higgins, Mike Williams, and Allen Robinson. We have created almost all of the weapons and potential with high ceiling that we could ever possibly need to be successful in this sort of scoring format, in this sort of league. We're expecting that we're going to be able to work the waiver wire very, very well. If this is what we plan it to be, a casual league with friends, a work league, a family league, anything of that nature, you have to rely on your ability to understand that you're going to be able to get the important running backs out of the waiver wire that can make your team pop when you need to. What's harder to find is very high-end wide receivers that you can rely on from week to week. Can you go out on the waiver wire after the first couple weeks and find guys who once every three weeks are going to have a huge spike week? Sure you can. But in managed redraft, it's hard to know when to play those guys. And it's difficult sometimes to look at the numbers and put together a good idea of what to do with them. We're going to avoid that. We're going to make sure that we are so flush at the wide receiver position that we have assets for days that we're playing the right guys under the right matchups and situations to consistently be successful. And here at pick six, seven, that's a trend that we expect to continue. We've seen another set of quarterbacks come off the board after we take Allen Robinson, Lamar Jackson, and Joe Burrow each go. Elijah Mitchell goes a couple picks after us. So one of the running backs that we would have been interested in is no longer there and available to us. Wide receivers flying off the board now. Chris Godwin, Brandon Cooks, Hollywood Brown, Michael Thomas, and Amon Ross St. Brown, all the guys that we just talked about, done, dusted, finished, off the board. There's one player remaining that at least I have in the same tier of all of these players, and that's Darnell Mooney. Guys like Adam Thielen, who we expect to be huge red zone targets, still available in this range. Rashad Bateman, if you're chasing that sort of breakout candidate, available in this range. Gabe Davis, if you're a Gabe Davis stand, God help you, available in this range. Juju Smith-Schuster, for those of you that feel like he's the guy in Kansas City, available in this range. Why reach for a quarterback, a tight end, or a running back that we're unsure of when players like that are still available? We're nearing the end of our run on taking wide receiver after wide receiver, but the value of Darnell Mooney in the middle of the sixth round is far too much for me to pass up. We're going to plug in that pick as well. Now that we have Jefferson, Higgins, Mike Williams, Robinson, and Mooney, we're really starting to take a deep look at what the quarterback market looks like and what the running back market looks like. It would have been awesome to see someone like Miles Sanders or A.J. Dillon fall to us in the middle of the seventh round, but that's not what's happening in this particular draft. A quick look at the running back board shows us that at least according to Sleeper ADP, Kareem Hunt is the best available option, and that's not one that I know I could pass up in this particular circumstance. We've now kind of left what is considered to be the traditional running back dead zone. Anytime that I see Ken Walker and Damian Harris go, which happens just in front of us here at the beginning of the seventh round, it triggers to me that we have switched back to where I can start to locate running backs of very good value. Now, Corderell Patterson high in ADP is not my cup of tea. Tony Pollard offers you a ton of upside, but I don't know if I love that upside as a running back too. 
I'd much prefer Tony Pollard to be someone who is my running back three that I'm potentially looking to flex. What I do see a little bit further down the board, however, is Chase Edmonds, a guy that I expect to be used very heavily at the beginning of the season that should offer me tremendous upside in a running back two position. There's many teams in this particular league, especially if you can see these on YouTube, that have running back twos that are somewhat questionable. There are teams who have running back threes and fours already that may not offer the same sort of consistency that we should see from Chase Edmonds. Chase Edmonds is by and far the highest player that I have on my board at this point and allows me to feel good about taking five wide receivers in the first six picks. So we'll plug in Chase Edmonds. We get to brush a little bit of sweat off our brow. We know that we have at least moved past a dreaded area of having that starting spot left open on our team. Now, as we watch the market develop, we're a little bit less worried about wide receivers that are going in this range. Devontae Smith off the board, Elijah Moore off the board, Drake London off the board, Rashad Bateman off the board just before we took Chase Edmonds. These are very high upside players that we'd love to have in our wide receiver core. But in a world where Darnell Mooney and Allen Robinson are two guys who may not even make our week-to-week lineup, we feel pretty solid about that position and the ceiling that we've been able to create there. Hunter Renfro, Brandon Ayuk, Tyler Lockett, Chris Olave, these are not guys who really move the needle as a wide receiver six in this sort of format. From the running back perspective, there are some extremely interesting candidates that we could get into here, especially considering that we've waited so long on running back. To see names like James Cook, who's going to catch a ton of passes in Buffalo, and Ramondre Stevenson, who is one of my favorite breakout candidates at the running back position, still still being available to us here in the middle of the eighth, is very encouraging. It tells us we have a good opportunity to get the sort of guys that we want to get. What we have to do before we make that investment on a third running back is take good stock of the quarterback market. I'll try and count along with these here, and this is not in order. I'm just going left to right to take stock of these teams. We've seen Jalen Hurts, Russell Wilson, Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, and Justin Herbert go. That means there's 10 quarterbacks off the board. We haven't seen Aaron Rodgers. We haven't seen Kirk Cousins. We haven't seen Matt Stafford. We're a little bit worried about Stafford's elbow, and I'm okay with kind of fading him out of this quarterback 12 range that we're looking for at the moment. But Aaron Rodgers, we expect to be dependable. Kirk Cousins matches up perfectly with Justin Jefferson. It's just a question of when do we take the plunge? Every team in this league already has their first quarterback except for team number two that will have two picks after we make this before it comes back to us in round nine and ourselves. Before we're willing to take the plunge on running back, we have to ask, if we pass up quarterback, Aaron Rodgers comes off the board, maybe someone else decides they're going to take a second quarterback and Kirk Cousins comes off the board too. Are we willing to go into the season with someone like Derek Carr or Trey Lance, for example? Derek Carr, more of your stable option. Trey Lance, more of your shoot for the moon option. I'm comfortable going after one of those guys if it doesn't go my way. I would much rather in this particular instance see a strong and stable third running back that I like more than jumping at Aaron Rodgers here just because I feel like I have to. So we're going to play one of my favorite games, which is quarterback chicken. Many of the things that we've learned from the ramp up series, we're getting to institute in uh, in real time here as we go. Of all the running backs previously mentioned, James Cook and Ramondre Stevenson are my favorites. I'm going to take Ramondre Stevenson here because I absolutely love the potential upside, and I'm very much out on Damian Harris this year. This is going to take us up to our ninth round pick. Justin Jefferson, T. Higgins, Mike Williams, Allen Robinson, and Darnell Mooney are there for us as a wide receiving core. Alvin Kamara, Chase Edmonds, Ramondre Stevenson are there for us as a running back core. Tight end, we're not worried about. Since the middle range where we've seen guys like Schultz and Hawkinson come off the board, we've recently lost Knox, Goddard, Ertz. We're still not worried. These are not names that terrify us. Fryermuth still available. Our number one target, Cole Komet, still available. Albert O, we'll take it. David Njoku, we'll take it. Noah Fant, we'll take it. If all else fails, Austin Hooper and Gerald Everett are there at the end of the draft. No need to pay much attention to that particular position group. Quarterback chicken, we think we might dare ourselves to go yet one more round before we take the plunge. Matt Stafford, Trey Lance, and Derek Carr, all still available, have a higher ADP than Kirk Cousins, our main target since we took Justin Jefferson at the top of round one. 
thinking maybe we go a little bit longer. At this point, every single team in the league has their first quarterback. We're now daring folks to start wasting picks on their second quarterback before we take one, and that's a game I think we always want to play. Let's take a look at running backs and wide receivers. We lost James Cook. We lost Rashad Penny, who has become even trendier since the hernia injury to Ken Walker. But here we are trying to evaluate whether we want an aging Melvin Gordon, a potentially ascending Damian Pierce, James Robinson, who could be fully healthy for week one, Alexander Madison, who is an extremely high quality handcuff, given that we are not the team that took Dalvin Cook and juxtaposing those guys versus a wide receiving core that contains the likes of Alan Lazard, Robert Woods, Christian Kirk, Chase Claypool, Sky Moore, all kinds of names that jump out at you there. I'm going to go a different way, much to the chagrin of uh, many other folks in the JWB community. But here, I'm going to grab a my guy in the middle of round nine. I'm looking even earlier than this, and I'm willing to do so in round six, seven, eight sometimes, depending on how big the league is and who I'm playing with. I'm willing to use those picks to go after Kadarius Tony. To be able to take Kadarius Tony in the middle of the ninth round as a wide receiver six for me is absolutely a no brainer. Here, I'm doing exactly what I'm looking for in a late wide receiver pick. I'm taking a second year player in an ascending offense that's set to have positive regression. On his day when he plays, Tony looks simply untouchable. He has all the raw skills and all the, and he has everything that you would need to be a wide receiver one. Everything that you can see Tyreek Hill do on a field to juke out a defender and score a long touchdown, you can see that in some plays with Kadarius Tony. The issue is the injury and how much he plays. But that's baked into the cost, taking the man here in the middle of the ninth round. In a world where the Giants offense performs at an average level and Kadarius Toney is the main beneficiary of that passing game, we could see a world in which by the second, third, fourth week of the season, Tony is in the same conversation as guys like Mike Williams and Allen Robinson. And if we've been able to create a new flex asset for ourselves from a ninth round pick, it's something we have to take. So we'll lock in Kadarius Toney. We'll look to get to the middle of the 10th. Let's scroll the draft board down a bit so we can just watch here at the end. 15 total rounds. We know we're only taking one quarterback, one tight end, one defense, one kicker. That leaves us 11 picks. We've now taken our sixth wide receiver, meaning we definitely want our fifth running back. In order to build up to that fifth running back, we've got to go a few consecutive picks on the running back. Now, before we do so, quick check on the quarterback market. We see that leading up to this pick, Matt Stafford, Derek Carr, Trey Lance come off the board. Now we're ready to pounce. Taking a look at the quarterback market after Kirk Cousins, the Nets' highest quarterback, at least according to my rankings, is Justin Fields. According to ADP, it's Tua Tungavailoa. This means now we finally take the plunge at quarterback. So we're going to lock in Kirk Cousins to stack with Justin Jefferson in the middle of the 10th round. This is is how you play quarterback chicken. This is what is meant by guys like Jake Perry and Tyler when they tell you to wait on your quarterback. We are just as happy to take Kirk Cousins in the middle of the 10th round as we would have been to reach for Dak in the middle of the 7th where we took Chase Edmonds. But because we waited an extra three rounds to take Kirk Cousins, we were able to take a guy we feel good about who we're not necessarily committed to. So if better streamable options appear on the wire, we're happy to get them. But the benefit of us waiting the additional three rounds is that Chase Edmonds, Ramondre Stevenson, and Kadarius Toney were able to be added to this team, creating a substantially higher base at running back and a higher ceiling at wide receiver to really, really help us out. So now we've locked down the quarterback situation. We've gotten into the middle of round 11. We're looking for running backs that can offer us something. We've been able to take Alvin Kamara in the middle of the second to be our RB1. Chase Edmonds in the middle of the seventh at the end of the dead zone, just outside of it to be our RB2. And we've got all the ceiling in the world sitting there available to us with Ramondre Stevenson as our RB3. We need two more that we can add. And we're looking for high upside, good potential, could be played right away. High upside, good potential, could be played right away. A few guys fit the bill here in the middle of the 11th. There's Neheim Hines, Tyler Algier, Marlon Mack, Kenny Gainwell, Khalil Herbert, J.D. McKissick, just to name a few. Jamal Williams still out there and available as well. What we're going to do here is plug in Khalil Herbert. It's a new offense in Chicago. 
there's great potential that Herbert could see some week to week value that we haven't necessarily anticipated for him just because it's a new offense and we're unsure of his role. But what we do know is that if something happens to David Montgomery, he should immediately benefit from a high amount of passing volume and additional rush carries that he would never see in a world where each are on the field together. Khalil Herbert as our RB4 offers us an opportunity to have weeks in which he would step in potentially even above Chase Edmonds as our RB2. That's the perfect scenario for where we're at currently. As more picks continue to come in, almost none of them are running back. Only Neheim Hines goes in all of the picks between us picking in the middle of the 11th and now in the middle of the 12th. Another name that fits very similar to what we have with Khalil Herbert is Kenny Gainwell. So we'll finish up our running back position by taking Kenny Gainwell as our RB5. That means we'll go into the season with Alvin Kamara, Chase Edmonds, Ramondre Stevenson, Khalil Herbert, and Kenny Gainwell. We've given ourselves a good platform at the end of our running back picks where injuries and potential could lead to something that increases their value over where we're taking them at ADP. Finally, time to look to tight end. We've waited. We ignored it. We didn't even talk about Cole Komet when his time came up. Wanted to make a point here about what the tight end market looks like. As we've been stacking up solid options like Chase Edmonds, Ramondre Stevenson, Kadarius Tony, Kirk Cousins, Khalil Herbert, and Kenny Gainwell in rounds seven through six, our competition has been taking Knox, Goddard, Gasicki, Herb Smith, Hunter Henry, Albert O, Zach Hertz, Pat Fryermuth, Cole Komet. Have at it. Let everyone else take those stabs at tight end. Here we are at 13-6, the last possible pick that we would ever use on tight end, and the market contains Noah Fant, it contains Tyler Higby, Robert Tanyan, Gerald Everett, Austin Hooper, many viable names that we're happy to go into the year with. What we'll do is take David Njoku, a guy who we heavily expect to outperform a middle of the 13th round ADP, especially now that we believe we have final clarity on Jacoby Brissett as his starting quarterback for the first 11 games of the season. Brissett targets tight ends at a substantially higher rate than what is average. We're in a half PPR league where if we can simply get three, four, five catches out of Njoku a week, he's going to deliver a higher number than most of the tight ends that are drafted ahead of him. For us to focus very heavily on wide receiver at the beginning of the draft and running back in the middle and still have David Njoku available to us at the last pick that we would take him is an absolute godsend. And I would expect that you would see very similar names. If Njoku's not there for you, someone like a Hunter Henry might be. Maybe you prefer a guy like Hooper or Everett more than Njoku. Again, more power to you. The point is, is that if you're not getting the top three, you want to wait and you want to build your team to look like this one does here. Well, we got to turn our attention to defense because it's ESPN and we don't have a choice. All kinds of different defenses that we can take. No one in particular we care about. Chargers, 49ers, Rams, Ravens, Cowboys, Bills, Bucks. A lot of the usual suspects are are already off the board. We're going to go a different way if I can verify that they have not been taken, which they have not. We're going to find ourselves the Browns defense. Why are we doing that? The Browns defense are a defense that you should be able to target a little bit later in your drafts, or if you're like me and you're waiting to the end to take kicker and defense, you may see that they're available to you. When you're taking a defense at the beginning of the year, the only thing that we're really concerned with is who they play in the beginning. The 49ers start with a soft schedule. The Eagles start with the soft schedule. These are two defenses that I would definitely target. But the Browns will start with the Baker Mayfield revenge game against the Panthers, and I'm unsure of what to expect from that game. But I do think the Browns have a good defense, and I do think that they will play a slow, methodical offense in a world where Jacoby Brissett is the quarterback. And all of these factors should add up to a good outing for the Browns. Week two, we get the Jets. We don't even know if Zach Wilson is or isn't available for that game, or if that's a good thing or bad thing. So by taking the Browns, I've given myself the ability to just plug in a defense for the first couple of weeks and see how it goes. If I have to draft one, I want something I can set and forget, which is what we're doing in this particular instance. Quick look through kickers to see who is available. I'm scanning for one name in particular. I'm seeing that Butker, Tucker, Carlson, Prater, Gay, Koo, Tyler Bass, Evan McPherson have all been taken, leaving for us my favorite target when I have to take a kicker. Where are you, my friend? Maybe I just can't read. Who knows? I guess we'll we'll have to search by player and see if we can figure it out. The name I'm looking for is Jake Elliott. 
and it's very similar to the same analysis on the Browns. I'm looking for someone who I, I expect to be able to deliver in the first couple of weeks of the season. The Eagles will begin the year playing the Tigers or Tigers. Good Lord. I'm thinking baseball. They'll begin the year playing the Lions, giving us every opportunity to have Jake Elliott score some points for us right out of the gate. In week two, the Eagles will host the Vikings, another defensive matchup where I feel good about Elliott's ability to score some points. So we're going to search through some players and see if we can finish this draft off with Jake Elliott, my favorite target for kicker when I have to take one. Yeah, maybe he's drafted and I don't see it. All right, well, you know what? Let's go ahead and get this wrapped up. So let's just click the button on Nick Folk because that's another great option that you can always take that I'd be happy to live with all year until their bye week. But go after Jake Elliott when you have the ability to do so. Live streaming never, never works out quite the way you want it to. Let's take a quick reset before we get out of here. We came into this draft with the sixth pick, expecting to focus heavily on running back. We expected to take wide receivers very heavily in rounds three through six, running backs following that, we're looking to wait at tight end, and we're looking to wait at quarterback. What we have been able to assemble here is a good team that deviated slightly from those principles. We have to be malleable. We have to adjust our circumstances. We never expected to see Justin Jefferson at 106. But when available, that's a pick that we have to make. That means I have to chase a little bit more running back upside than I might otherwise do. As a result of that, our running back core is Alvin Kamara in the second round. Chase Edmonds in the seventh, Ramondre Stevenson in the eighth, Khalil Herbert in the 11th, Kenny Gainwell in the 12th. We got a good leader in Alvin Kamara. We got a stable number two in Chase Edmonds, and then three guys in Stevenson, Herbert, and Gainwell that can give us a huge ceiling. Because we were able to get Justin Jefferson, we have created a wide receiving core that we expect no one could ever match up with. First round pick goes to Justin Jefferson third to T Higgins, fourth to Mike Williams, fifth to Allen Robinson, sixth to Darnell Mooney, and ninth to Kadarius Toney. We can use up to three wide receivers a week, meaning that we can start the year with Jefferson, Higgins, and Williams. Watch how Allen Robinson performs. Watch what the Bears offense and the Giants offense does while we keep an eye on Moody and Tony. And as those players begin to grow, as bye weeks and injuries pop up, we won't skip a beat at that position. We've waited on quarterback and we were able to take Kirk Cousins in the middle of the 10th round as quarterback 13 off the board to pair with Justin Jefferson. We've waited on tight end and we took David Njoku at 13-6, the latest tight end off the board, right before we took kicker and defense. And we took a kicker and defense, but quite honestly, we never really care about who they are. I feel like this is a great team following these principles. One of the reasons that we did the ramp up series is so that we could hear from some experts like Jake Tyler and Wyatt on why they make the decisions that they make. Why are they able to not jump at the RB2, even though they see that open spot sitting there every time they go through and pick a wide receiver that would drop immediately to the bench? Why are they so hell bent on waiting on quarterback and tight end? Why aren't they using even a 12th round pick on a defense instead of waiting until the 14th round? I hope you were able to learn a lot from the series. I know I certainly was able to, and we've been able to implement some of those ideas that we've learned into a pretty good team here. I'd be happy taking this into any league that I go into, regardless of the level of play, but to assemble a team like this in a league with friends, family, coworkers, all the better. I'm ready to run it all season. I hope you are too. Get out there over the next couple of weeks and crush all of your redraft leagues. JWB will always be here to help you out. You can find me at jwill underscore FF. All of our content is at jwbfantasyfootball.com. We thank all of you for your love and support, and I cannot wait to see you again.